Yes, so welcome to this webinar, which is uh, part of the Work Package 9 under the EU GEMRI 2. And uh, I, I think quite some of you are familiar with the EU GEMRI already or actually participating actively. Um, but for those of you who aren't, uh, the EU GEMRI is the second very big project financed by the EU on uh, combating and fighting antimicrobial resistance. And there are nine work packages, and this one is the one on access to antibiotics. Uh, but you will hear a bit about some of the others as well today. So we only have one hour. So I thought to make this really efficient, I will ask you to turn off your camera, everybody, and Christine to unshare the slides. So then, once everybody has turned off the camera, I would like to invite Sine, Christine, and Sophia to turn on the camera so you can see the work package leaders of the work package nine. I see Christine, I see Sine. Yes, you can wave your hands. <laughs> Where is Sophia? Is she going to join us, Christine? I, there there she, is. she is. There she is. So these are the work package leaders of the work package nine. Then we have Benedict with us from the WHO. So everybody turn off the camera again and Benedict, turn it off on, please. There he is. Welcome. Happy you're with us today. Good afternoon. And we also have from the work package six, some members with us today. That's Marta and maybe Sorry. more. <laughs> there, you, there you are. Welcome. <laughs> Hi. And then we will jump right into the program. My name is Ute Sönksten. I'm a clinical microbiologist from State and Serum Institute, and I'm so happy to join the Berg Package 9. And I'll tell you a bit about uh, how we work with EU targets for antimicrobial resistance, and then I will uh, give the floor to Benedict talking about WHO working within this area. So, Christine, if you will share slides again. Here it comes. Yes. And maybe you can enlarge it a bit. It's a bit small, at least for me. Is it small? I, I don't think I can. No, enlarge it's fine now. It's fine Sorry. now. Yes. So evidence for the use of small spectrum antibiotics in primary care and particularly for general practitioners. And I don't know how many general practitioners are with us today, but um, maybe we can have them in a different meeting talking more about how do you then move on from evidence to practice. But I will show you a bit about the prescribing targets that the EU set up uh, last summer. Uh, then Benedict will talk to us about the evidence for use of particular narrow spectrum antibiotics in primary care. We will have uh, time for discussion and uh, Marta and Christine will take us to the next steps in the EU GEMRI. Next slide, please. So the EU targets uh, that were agreed upon last summer, I think that was in June 2023, say that we all should aim for a reduction in the total consumption for humans by 20% by 2030 compared to the baseline of 2019. And 2019 was chosen because there was a pandemic in between that really made everything a bit unreliable when it comes to consumption. Then the second really important goal is that 65% of the antibiotic consumption should be from what we call the access group. Mm -hmm. And I believe that Benedict will talk a bit more about that. And as you probably know, that primary care accounts for the biggest proportion of antibiotic use, um, at least in the Western European countries, it's often around 80%. So therefore, working with the GPs is, a particular, is of particular interest when it comes to antibiotic use. And you can find, if, you, if you're not already aware of this, I put in the, um, 
the link so you can actually read a bit more about the EU recommendations and these targets. Next slide, Christine. So this comes uh, is a bit messy, but I hope you get the picture. Um, so on the left side, you see the usage in primary care or community care um, as measured by the ESACnet, that's the ECDC compiling data from all uh, European countries. Um, and the darker the color, the higher the rate of usage. And it goes from, I believe it's about eight DDD, which is the defined daily doses per um, inhabitant, um, eight DDD per 1000 inhabitants and up to 31 DDD. So that's quite a big variation out there. And if you look at the right graph, uh, you can see how the usage then is divided into different antibiotic classes. And the light blue one are the ones you really want to aim for using in your praxis. That those are the penicillins. Yes, Christine, next. And also here, there's a report uh, that you can read telling you a bit more about where is your country and where is the, uh, the EU, what is the EU aiming for? Next slide. So the trends as reported by the ECDC ESACnet report that came out in November last year said that the, uh, the total consumption, and here we are working with an EU population weighted mean, the total consumption has decreased by 2.5% since the baseline year of 2019. In 2022, which is the last uh, number or the last figures in the report, only 10 or approximately 36% of the countries exceeded the EU targets of at least 65%. So the rest is still below. Then there was a significant decrease, which is very positive in the usage of tetracyclines, cephalosporins and other beta-lactams, macrolides, lincosomers and streptogramins and quinolones. So there is, in general, a reduction in the use of broad-spectrum antibiotics, but there were no statistically significant trends when it comes to penicillins. And we all agree that these are the ones that you should use the most. Next one. So I will tell you a bit uh, of an example from Denmark, because I'm from Denmark and I happen to be responsible for the surveillance program here. Um, we had a national action plan that was from 2017 to 2020. It was then extended to 2021 and actually the summer of 2022 due to the pandemic. Um, it had very strong support from our GPs. They were involved in drafting the, the action plan and they had some ideas of what they wanted to work with. And so we had two targets for primary care. The one was to reduce the amount of prescriptions issued per 1,000 inhabitants. And the second one was to increase the proportion of penicillin we prescribed compared to a baseline of the year 2016. Next. And there were quite some research projects and maybe some of you already are familiar with them because two of them were, were pan-European projects. The one is the Happy Audit and the other one, the Happy Patient that was just finished last summer. Um, then there was a project on better prevention of urinary tract infections. Eh? And there was an evaluation on the dosage and treatment duration for respiratory tract infections because we had the impression that the duration was too long actually to cure the infection. Next slide. And so this shows how it went with the goal one, reducing the number of prescriptions per 1,000 inhabitants. And here it's the same principle as you saw from the ESACnet, the darker the color, the higher the number of prescriptions in this case. And you can see how all municipalities, so it shows to Denmark and the municipalities in Denmark, how all municipalities actually were able to reduce the number of prescriptions per 1,000 inhabitants. That was really, really positive. Then comes the goal two, and that's the next slide. And it shows that the very top curve, the light blue ones, one, which is the penicillins, beta lactamus sensitive penicillins, how they actually dropped when they tried to reduce the number of prescriptions because that those were the ones that were naturally reduced when not prescribing to respiratory tract infections. 
And so they had to work on different schemes to make sure that the proportion of penicillins remained high while the others were reduced. And then you can also see the interesting part, how the pandemic then had that really large drop and it now is going back to where it was in the years before. Next slide. All of this comes, of course, with not only knowing about uh, what to prescribe and to stick to your penicillins whenever those are relevant for your infection. They are also about behavioral insights. And I think Marta will say a bit about that because that's actually a different work package. And probably, hopefully, Benedict will say something about it. And I will leave the floor to you now, Benedict. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um... Can I share my slides? Or Kristen, yes, that would them. be great. But Benedict, you're a little bit faint. I'm faint now. Perfect. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, um, I'll try first to share. Oops. Now I always have this issue that I don't know. Oops. Can you see my slide presentation? That's perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I, I'm not going to, so should I present myself maybe, or does everybody know who I am? I assume not. Go <laughs> um, ahead. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm an infectious disease physician. Um, I'm the unit head uh, within the AMR division in WHO who's responsible for antimicrobial stewardship and antimicrobial use surveillance. But until um, October last year, I was a team lead for essential medicines. And before that, until 2021, I was actually an infectious diseases physician and researcher at Geneva University Hospitals. So um, I was asked to talk about the evidence for the use of narrow air spectrum antibiotics in primary care, particularly focusing on respiratory tract infections. Um, declarations of interest, I have none to declare other than that I'm a full-time staff member of WHO. We don't need to spend much time on this, but you know that AMR is a major threat to global health. Um, it's estimated that one child dies every three minutes from MDR or sepsis, especially in, 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 in low middle income countries. Um, the figures are difficult to estimate, but um, you may have seen the gram data published in the land that talks about 1.3 million deaths attributable to AMR per year. And um, AMR has also a very important financial impact, putting people into poverty, um, having an impact also on livelihoods of people, if you think of AMR in animals. And both the inappropriate use of antibiotics and the lack of access to essential antibiotics is common. Um, if you look at it from a global perspective, clearly the lack of access is mostly an issue in low middle income countries, but we have seen during COVID that there may be also situations where you have shortages of um, very essential antibiotics in, in high income countries in, in, in Europe. So you've seen the slide before about Europe showing the variation in antimicrobial use. If you look at it globally, you have an even larger variation. And um, with an overuse generally of broad spectrum antibiotics, but it's important to note that globally, many countries in low middle income settings actually have probably have also a problem with access and underuse antibiotics. Um, we also know that a large proportion of all antibiotics used globally are used for mild, self-limiting, mostly viral respiratory tract infections. It's estimated that there are about 5 billion prescriptions of antibiotics per year, so uh, more than one for every uh, two human beings. And you also know the inappropriate use drives the emergence and spread of AMR. Next slide. Um, yeah, my, 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 my. Animation and why is it especially important this year? Because in September there's going to be a UN General Assembly high-level meeting on antimicrobial resistance, where hopefully member states can uh, find consensus on um, how to combat AMR. And um, this may also include some specific targets, um, potentially also uh, regarding antimicrobial use. So let's talk a little bit about the spectrum because it's in the title. And um, I uh, didn't make it now interactive, but um, you see all these different antibiotics, not of all, the, all of them are penicillins, but 
Um, ranking those um, may be actually more difficult than um, it seems initially. I think most would agree that probably penicillin has the most narrow spectrum, that amoxicillin clavulant has a larger spectrum than amoxicillin, but where would you put cefuroxime? Where would you put cloxacillin? So it can actually be quite complicated. And this is nicely illustrated by a study done in France where they tried to rank different beta lactams. Um, there was a study wanting to look at de escalation, so more for the hospital setting. And um, the details are not important, but um, um, you can see that it took quite a lot of rounds to actually come to a consensus. Um, so it's 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 maybe less straightforward than one may think in the beginning, and um, this also has to do with the fact that we talk about a spectrum of an antibiotic. Um, I don't think we always talk about the same thing because very often it's just the activity against the pathogen that's considered. So is it active against um, extended spectrum beta lactam mass producing E. coli? Is it uh, active against um, other gram negative or against gram positive? But that's only one element, right? You would also want to take into account the selection of resistance in other organisms and on the impact of transmission of AMR. And this may be different for the same antibiotic. And then clearly, when we select antibiotics to be prescribed as first choice, we need to take other elements also into account, such as toxicity, safety, price, and availability. Um, so, given the lack of a clear consensus of what constitutes a narrow or broad spectrum antibiotic, WHO tried to come up with a aware classification. And you've heard about the access target 65% for Europe, 60% for now for WHO. Um, and this is based on the essential medicines list. So um, in, since 1977, WHO publishes every two years an essential medicines list. So the idea is that these are the medicines that should be really available in a functioning healthcare system at all times in assured quality. And you see that in 1977, there were 16 antibiotics out of 240 medicines. This excludes the anti-tuberculous medicine, so about 7%. And most of them are still listed. And you see also that the penicillins, um, ampicillin um, are, are there. Um, with the Global Action Plan on Antimicrobial Resistance, there was then an effort to review the antibiotics and then the EML. And how was it done? So a whole variety of infections was uh, considered. Most of them are syndromes, including the respiratory tract infection. Most of them community acquired. And the idea was mostly to look at what are the most appropriate antibiotics for empiric use. There are some exceptions for specific pathogens, but in general, it's really syndromes. And this was based on an extensive review of systematic review and guidelines. And the, then the idea was to come up with first and second choice antibiotics based on efficacy, safety, and impact on antimicrobial resistance. And I put you the um, QR, QR code there. Oops, maybe it's like this. You can um, copy it. And um, this publication highlights how this was done for all um, the different syndromes. Um, And in order to, to classify the antibiotics based on the impact of resistance, AWARE was created. So AWARE means access, watch, and reserve. There's actually a fourth category of not recommended antibiotics. Don't think it's a major problem in, in, in Europe, but in many countries they have fixed those combinations of antibiotics that really have no good indication. Uh, you could imagine, for example, a macrolide combined with um, um, uh, cephalosporin or, or, or things like that. So access antibiotics, classic example would be amoxicillin or penicillin. Uh, most often the first or second choice for most infectious syndromes have a low resistance potential and then you have the watch antibiotics like ciprofloxacin or some of the cephalosporins or the macrolides that can be indicated but have a higher resistance potential and you really need to consider when do you use, use them and when is it more appropriate to use an access antibiotic or no antibiotic because as I mentioned most antibiotics are actually given as you know for indications that um, are of viral origin and then you have this third category the reserve antibiotics that are last resort options against multi-drug resistant organisms that would be for example cholestein or some of the newer agents. Um, now you may say, what is the evidence of classifying 
the different um, antibiotics based on the impact on resistance and, and, and this is aware categorization evidence-based. It turns out it's actually quite difficult to look at that. This was the systematic review looking at the risk of colonization or infection um, with um, certain types of multidrug resistance organisms based on the access watch or reserve category. Why is it difficult? Because these are not randomized control trials, there are a lot of confounding factors. Um, the definition of exposure is very different. Sometimes a patient had an antibiotic a week before, sometimes it's been three months before. You also know that patients often get a combination therapy or multiple antibiotics in sequence, which makes it quite difficult then to really look at the individual impact and issues like dose and duration are generally not taken into account. Nevertheless, if you look at the evidence, I think there are two key points. One is any antibiotic treatment increases the risk of a patient being colonized or infected with a multidrug resistant organisms. But in general, excess antibiotics have a lower risk than watch and reserve antibiotics. It's important to note that not all excess antibiotics are essential. So, um, if you look at the 2023 AWARE classification, there are 87 access antibiotics. Um, quite a lot, many, many cephalosporins. Some of them are quite widely used. And um, at the last EML of these, only 21 are considered essential, of 41 essential antibiotics overall. Um, so only a small percentage are really um, um, crucial to treat uh, patients worldwide. Um, you also already heard about the 60% access target that's actually been endorsed by many member states and that's in the WHO Global Program of Work. Um, there are now discussions in the context of the high-level meeting in New York if that shouldn't be increased to 80%. Very clearly also, it's not the only target that there can be. Um, we've seen it before. Um, in, in, in the presentation, absolute use obviously is also important and we're currently looking into um, maybe establishing also absolute uh, indicators for absolute use based on um, um, the incidence of infections in a country. It's obviously a little more complicated, requires some modeling, but um, ultimately will be needed. So I want to rephrase the presentation. What is the evidence for the use of essential? So not all, because the, the other, only essential antibiotics are essential. Um, access antibiotics in primary care. I have some good news and some bad news. I think I start with the bad news. Um, if you ask me for the evidence, usually we'd like to see evidence from multi-center randomized controlled trials that are high quality, um, ideally superiority trials, not just non-inferiority trials. But these hardly exist. Why? Because many of these antibiotics are quite old. They weren't approved um, based on the same criteria. So it's really quite difficult to find um, very good evidence that we would expect right now. And um, to be fair, um, even newly approved antibiotics um, usually are not approved based on superiority trials, but it's non-inferiority trials and often it's in patients who do not even have multidrug resistant um, infections. So or aren't even at a very high risk of that. So it's it's a problem that's still there, that um, the evidence base is not good as good as we'd like it to be. Um, but the good news is that decades of clinical experience show that narrow spectrum antibiotics are very effective when used appropriately. And I like um, this slide a lot because it just shows you the survival in pneumococcal bacteremia, so a very severe um, uh, complication of pneumonia. And before antibiotic treatment, the mortality was nearly 100%, and it's only with the advent of penicillin that really um, most patients could be, um, uh, would survive. Um, now you may ask, yes, that's uh, nice, but these are old data. What about antibiotic resistance? And um, if you look at the pathogens that are the most important with regard to antimicrobial resistance, there has been the priority pathogen list by WHO since 2017. The new update just came out a few weeks ago. And um, you have a number of pathogens um, divided into three groups, critical, high, and medium. The idea 
mainly initially was to um, uh, give an indication to pharmaceutical industry which antibiotics should we develop. But if you look now, which are respiratory pathogens, you have uh, three community-acquired respiratory pathogens because obviously you have Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, which can cause pneumonia in hospitals. But community-acquired, we have Group A streptococci that are macrolide resistant. As you know, penicillin resistance is not an issue with group A streptococci. We have strep pneumonia, but not the penicillin resistance, and we'll talk about why, but the macrolide resistant, but macrolide shouldn't generally be used as first line. And then maybe a little bit more relevant, hemophilus influenza, that's ampicillin resistance. So what uh, case with penicillin resistance or penicillin non-susceptible streptococcus pneumonia? Um, it really, if you do not have a meningitis or infection of the central nervous system, it's very clear that with adequate doses of uh, a beta lactam, mostly amoxicillin or penicillin, you can treat these patients adequately, and most will have a good outcome. Um, so the penicillin resistance is, is is not really a reason not to use amoxicillin and streptococcus pneumonia. That is the main pathogen we worry about in most situations when we talk about respiratory tract infections, um, especially but even if um, sinusitis or titis media, it's, 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 it's often um, streptococcus pneumonia, but there um, penicillin resistance is not an issue. And um, even if not everybody has success, it doesn't mean that it's due to the resistance because um, many different factors contribute to the success of treatment. Um, I'm not going to go into detail here, but um, so pneumococcal resistance for respiratory tract infections um, for penicillin, not a problem if you give adequate doses. Um, based on the recommendation in the essential medicines list, um, we've prepared the WHO aware antibiotic book, which has been translated in several languages, has also been translated in, in Italian, for example, and is used in some settings in Italy. It's um, a book um, that highlights the treatment of common infections because we know that countries do not have guidelines, maybe less of an issue in Europe, but uh, worldwide it definitely is a problem. It has these short infographics and exists also as a smartphone app. Why do I show it? Because if you look at the most common infections in primary care, you see two things. Either they can be safely treated without an antibiotic because they are viral in origin, or if an antibiotic is indicated, it's an access antibiotic. The only exception here is acute bloody diarrhea, but that is relatively rare in high-income countries. So just based on this, you see that a 60% access target should be relatively easily achievable because this is really the majority of patients um, um, have, have one of these infections. and. Um, we had a number of 80% of antibiotic use occurring in primary care. Globally, it's probably even higher. It's more 90 to 95%. And the access targets applies to national use, so that's really driven by primary care use. Nevertheless, if we look at uh, data worldwide, it's a study just looking at the observed watch antibiotic use, comparing to what you would expect based on the burden of disease when watch antibiotics would be really indicated. And what you can see is that most countries are in this yellow zone, so where uh, countries use more than expected with regard to watch antibiotics. So it's really an overuse of watch antibiotics in most settings. Let's look at some specific infections of so a community acquired pneumonia. You have amoxicillin and penicillin. I know that in many Scandinavian countries, penicillin is still used as first line. Um, that's probably not the case in most other settings. Um, maybe a little bit of a disadvantage that you may need to give it more often on lower bioavailability, but in general it works very well. Um, and if you look at the evidence from the review, it's really quite difficult because there's no good studies. It's often comparing rather a variety of different beta lactams with combination therapy or others. But in general, if you look at the evidence, there's no real um, sign or indication that one antibiotic is better than the other in terms of efficacy. 
Um, interestingly, um, the two recent studies, one has been presented at the European um, Conference for Infectious Diseases just in April. It's a study done in Sub-Saharan Africa in children, but I think it's still relevant, looking at uh, children hospitalized for severe pneumonia and then uh, looking at, on the one hand, oral switch and different durations of therapy, but one aspect also was looking at amoxicillin versus amoxicillin clavulanide. And uh, the data aren't uh, uh, published in a journal yet, but based on the presentation at the conference, there was no different in uh, difference in outcome. So um, we heard about the Haemophilus influenza that may be the main uh, additional pathogen or some maroxella covered by amoxicillin clavulanate, but that in real life clinical settings that doesn't seem to be a major problem. And then I found just uh, this trial, it's not a real randomized trial, but it's a kind of simulated trial from Sweden, again in children, looking at penicillin versus amoxicillin for pneumonia. There was a little bit more success with amoxicillin than with penicillin, um, but um, if no real difference in, 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 in severe clinical outcomes. And again, this is not a randomized controlled trial, but a simulation of one, so potentially also um, subject to bias. But um, it's just to illustrate that really um, um, the data are, 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 are um, a little bit missing, but real life clinical experience shows that these are uh, very effective options. This is, I apologize, very small. It's about pharyngitis, acute otitis media, and sinusitis. You have the same um, recommendations, essentially amoxicillin and, 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 and penicillin, often the, the first short recommendations. But um, for all these, in most cases, actually, you should not treat at all. And that's also emphasized in the book. Um, I know the title contains um, respiratory tract infections, but uh, lower urinary tract infections are also a key contributor to antimicrobial use. Uh, a little bit more uh, difficult. Um, I have to also say that for the evidence review, most of the studies obviously come from high income countries and not for the low middle income setting. And I think this may be a situation where really the epidemiology changed. Um, these are listed in alphabetical order, but clearly nitrofurantoin is probably the most effective given the relatively high prevalence of. Um, extended spectra better lactamase producing E. coli in many settings. It also has the advantage that it is not really used for anything else and that the impact on the microbiome is relatively low. Um, so nitrofurantine, um, in that sense, really the first choice. Um, unfortunately, it's not available in many in low middle income countries. Um, and we're trying now to look, uh, is there a way to make it more accessible? And then um, Christine asked me to quickly mention also pifmesilinam. So this hasn't been evaluated for the essential medicines list. It's not an essential antibiotic. There's some background noise. Um, um, and um, there have been several trials looking at pifmesilinam versus placebo versus other antibiotics which are older. And this is an interesting study looking at um, pifmesilinam versus ibuprofen in a double um, blind randomized control trial. Um, not surprisingly, there, there have been quite a few studies looking at that, and it can be an option for, for some patients not to use antibiotics, but to rather use um, symptomatic control. But in that trial, there was, um, so ibuprofen was clearly less effective, especially when it also comes to uh, second consultations. And um, a little bit concerningly, um, there were still um, 12 patients who developed a febrile urinary tract infections, um, all recovered with antibiotic treatment. But um, so this could be an option. Issue globally is just that it's not available in very many countries. And um, um, yeah, as I said, for now, it's probably uh, nitrofontein um, as a key antibiotic in many settings. So what is the evidence for the use of essential access antibiotics in primary care? I think it's very clear that most frequent infections can either be safely managed without antibiotics or with narrow spectrum access antibiotics, amoxicillin uh, or even penicillin. Adequately dosed amoxicillin or penicillin B remains effective against the large majority of pneumococci if you don't have a meningitis. 
overuse of watch antibiotic remains common in many settings. So lots of cephalosporin, macrolides, fluoroquinolones, and this really needs to be restricted. Um, so we need to globally um, reduce the unnecessary use of antibiotics. It's easier said than done, but um, that's probably the most important intervention because, as I showed you before, any use of antibiotics increases the risk of resistance. Reduce the use of watch antibiotics and the same time globally, but even when it comes to supply chain security, ensure that access to essential access antibiotics is guaranteed um, everywhere. And that's all from my side. Over. That was wonderful, Benedict. Thank you so much. Uh, much appreciated. There's already one question in the chat. Um, I don't know, Benedict, can you see that or do you want me to read it out loud? It uh, says, can I please check rationale for why sinusitis, sinusitis it, amoxicillin does for adults is one gram Q8 hours in WHO aware antibiotic book, whereas uh, phrenogitis or otitis media is 500 milligrams Q8 hours. Yeah, yeah. So um, first of all, I think we have to acknowledge that the evidence for the dosing of antibiotics is pretty bad, right? Um, even for the newer antibiotics, it's 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 really difficult to come up with um, evidence for the correct dosing. And unfortunately, I think many WHO guidelines, for example, do not include any recommendation on dosing, just for that reason, because you cannot do you know if you do a systematic, you will not come up with with good evidence. So. Um, we try to assess. I think for pharyngitis, the issue is that you mostly want to target group A streptococci, while for um, the sinusitis, it's the pneumococci. So where you may have penicillin non-susceptible strain, so you want to have a higher um, a higher dose. I think that's that's the main reason. It's a targeted pathogen is different, but both usually in most situations do not require any antibiotics. You know the different signs um, and, and, and symptoms that have been proposed to decide if somebody needs treatment for sinusitis. To be quite honest, these are not really very evidence-based either. For pharyngitis, you have a criteria like the center score, but there's more and more also the tendency um, to say that um, in general, you can also choose an approach where you do not treat and just observe the patient. There's another yep. question, Benedict, do you see that? What about adopting definitions of appropriateness to be used by the um, antimicrobial stewardship programs and just the ones of the Australian uh, national action plans? Yeah, so um, that comes in the end down to indicators and targets. And um, as you know, assessing appropriateness is can be quite difficult in the sense that it requires often chart review. If you talk about um, it on a global level, um, there's often lack of any electronic data or, you know, there's absolutely no data at all. But even if there's data, somebody needs to look at it and assesses, there's always a certain degree of subjectivity. But we definitely plan on, 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 on developing indicators. Some of them are relatively straightforward. You can look at guideline adherence. Um, problem then often becomes that um, doctors are not very good at writing down the diagnosis. So if you look at it globally, for example, um, very often in primary care, it's not the diagnosis of um, sinusitis or pharyngitis. It's just pain or fever. And then it becomes very difficult um, retrospectively to assess appropriateness. But we, we are looking into that, um, and especially for primary care, um, I think it's important. It has been a long neglected aspect of antimicrobial stewardship because focus was mainly on hospitals. But it's um, yeah, there's some challenges. Any other questions for Benedict or for Uta? Perhaps you've answered all of the questions. Maybe what we can do is we can start with Marta and then we can also, if questions arise in the meantime, we can go to questions. Okay, Marta, I will share the slides. Yeah, thanks.
Well, hello, everybody. <laughs> As a part of the EU Jam Right 2, the Join Actions, our groups are uh, focusing um, AM stewardship, building a EU, a EU common stewardship approach uh, in fields, the human, uh, the animals, and the environment, recognizing the transversal role, obviously, that the study of the behavioral change uh, has in this important part of the AMR strategies. Can you change, Christine? To the next slide. Yeah. So, uh, precisely in uh, antimicrobial stewardship in humans, uh, it's about optimizing the use of antimicrobial by using the correct one and the right uh, time and dose. And to do that, the antimicrobial needs to be accessible to use. That's why Christine is going to uh, present the other work package. Thanks, Marta. Um, so, you, so maybe you wonder um, why we're here talking about um, narrow spectrum antibiotics. So one of the work packages that we're working on in this new EU joint action is about strengthening access to antibiotics. You heard Benedict say several times that unfortunately this antibiotic isn't very well available, so maybe you should use this instead. Um, and that's something that we're we're aiming to work on. So we have um, 14 countries. You can see the countries in blue in the map uh, out of the 30 countries that are participating in the joint action that are, are participating in this access work. And our aim is to improve access um, within these select the countries that want to participate to selected antibiotics, particularly older narrow spectrum uh, and pediatric antibiotics. So we want to make sure what we want to, to try to do is to ensure that as a GP, when you prescribe an antibiotic, you're prescribing it based upon the patient and not uh, upon the availability in the pharmacy. Um, so what we're doing right now, we started in uh, at the beginning of this year, so we're just six months in, but now all of these 14 countries are in the process of identifying about 10 important antibiotic substances that are both considered clinically in, um, important, but also uh, a vulnerable supply chain. And we're looking at both human and veterinary products. Um, so once we get these products, uh, what we will be doing is, um, sorry, is uh, in collaboration with the national authorities examine and test national, regional, and European interventions. So we talked a bit about penicillin today. Um, and for example, penicillin came on to the, was mar first marketed in about 1950. Uh, and what happened is various strengths of penicillin have been launched uh, uh, in different countries. So, for example, Norway uses different strengths of penicillin than Sweden typically does. Um, so one of the, the obvious things to do is to, to look at the harmonization of strengths to make it easier for suppliers to provide harmonized strengths of penicillin so that we can ensure that penicillin is, is more widely available and reliably uh, available. So what we'll be doing is we'll be, once we get the country's list, which will happen uh, in the next month, um, we will be looking at those at the barriers, and then we'll be working uh, specifically on each product, trying to see how we can pragmatically um, uh, increase access, strengthen access to the, these products so that they will be available to you when you want to prescribe them for your patients. So that is uh, about uh, our work packages. Uh, Uta, do you see if there's any additional questions? Yes, there is a comment and a question. Great. Yes, and um, maybe the people themselves want to speak about it because I think these are really, the one is really good. The first one is about, don't you think that shortening the duration of treatment actually should be quite essential in tackling AMR? I think that would be really nice to discuss and we should have time enough for that. I don't know, Benjamin, would you like to, you know, talk more about it, say more, or shall we just jump into it? You want, you mean? Benedict? Yes, hello, oh, just no. um, oh, okay. a, a comment about that, um, because Benedict made a very clear presentation and I think uh, aim for that. But maybe because we spoke about the, 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 the dose, maybe one um, essential thing could be that if possible, uh, it's important to use the highest dose as possible, depending on the patient and 
also to try as much as possible to shorten the duration of treatment considering recent publication about the same outcome between uh, patient treated with long duration treatment and shortened therapy. Thank you. Yes, Benedict, any reply to that? Yeah, well, um, so completely agreed that durations have been generally too long, and that's actually an issue we see in countries when they adapt the antibiotic book, they go back to very long durations because that's um, what they used to. Now, the impact of the dose and duration on resistance is actually less clear than we would like it to be, especially for those, it's quite complicated. Um, there's a very nice publication um, in, in, I think, was Nature Medicine, um, looking at, for example, the impact of falsified and substandard medicines on AMR, and you, depending on the pathogen and the antibiotic, it can be either if the dose is too low or too high, you could imagine that you have a higher impact on resistance. Though so it's not so clear. It's not clear that giving a higher dose actually has a better impact on resistance. Um, with the duration, it's the same. It's not entirely clear. Probably it has a positive impact on transmission. Um, but again, it's, 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 um, it's less clear. So I think that's why it's really key um, not to treat patients who do not need at all. And then probably, you know, the different type of antibiotic really have a different impact. Then, you know, reducing duration, trying to optimize those things. But if you just strictly look at the evidence, it's, it's not so clear. Yes, and maybe I can add to that. I think also it very much depends on what organ are you treating. You know, where where is the infection placed is probably quite important also for for both the the duration, but also the risk of acquiring antimicrobial resistance. Do you have any other comments from some of the other participants on this? Could be Hi. nice to have a pen. Yeah, yeah, yeah Erika. Yeah. Is it possible? Um, hello, everybody. Thank you uh, for the opportunity of participating. Um, I'm here with a group that have developed recently a guide uh, to uh, improve prescription, antimicrobial prescription in primary care or ambulatory services, meaning uh, the ER uh, that uh, uh, also prescribe to outpatients. Okay. Um, yeah, that wasn't um, available in Portugal, in Portuguese, <laughs> and uh, it was a really recent work that came from a, a survey that we, a questionnaire that we put to our colleagues and uh, were upon, um, highlighted the need for that uh, information. Uh, it's still being reviewed, but we hope that will be a, a also in the future an audit um, um, instrument, yeah, uh, because we also put there the what you talked about about the uh, need for diagnosis, need for classification of the disease, and uh, it is um, it is our plan to in the future uh, keep track of the um, right or um, need uh, or or the need to improve the prescription for specific infections uh, respiratory or others um wanted to to share this for the group it's not my work alone of course <laughs> it's with the uh, prepicida in the region of lisbon and we really hope that it will um, help our our colleagues in everyday practice Just, just to uh, ask you, Erica, what kind of diagnostics are available for your GPs or your outpatient care? Is it, is it quite broad, or do you, and how much is it actually used? Do you know that? Uh, sorry, uh, the diagnosis. The diagnostics, like what type of diagnostics would be available to you to oh, know okay. what you're actually treating? Uh, in the the code, uh, in when we classify it, is it a question? Is it? Yes. Uh, yes. We we have uh, um, a code that we all use, like in hospital care. Uh, we have one list of possible diagnoses. In primary care, we also do have that in our system. So we all 
uh, should <laughs> classify the disease by the same names. We have amygdalitis, amygdalitis by streptococcus, uh, uh, pneumonia, uh, bronchitis, uh, all types of uh, uh, diagnoses are there. There are also the symptoms, so it can happen to appear classified as cough alone or fever alone, as you were talking about, but uh, our um, work would, would be in uh, trying to uh, classify it properly. Uh, yes, the... and I'm sorry you actually misunderstood me a bit because I, oh, I was thinking about the diagnostic test. Because okay. if you if you base okay. what what you base your diagnosis on, okay, then okay. Well, with the complementary tests, is it? We have the quick test um, for streptococcus pyogenes. Uh, that we can uh, ask for in the lab and have a uh, result in the same day. Uh, we also can have radiologic exams, but not in our primary care centers, we, but we can ask for it um, in local and pro relatively proxim uh, ones. Um, that varies a bit uh, with the, the location in the country. There are uh, places where people can do that uh, five minutes away by walking and there are some regions that are more isolated and that is not that simple but most of the regions uh, have uh, the, those diagnoses uh, helpful tests uh, available near Thank and you. in the same way. <laughs> That's that's really excellent. So we've got two questions in the chat. I see um, uh, at least, or no, we're getting another one as well. Um, so the first is um, using higher doses will impact on antimicrobial consumption reported as DDD. Is the DDD for amoxicillin going to change? I can't say because it's um, not done directly by WHO, but it's a WHO collaborating center in Norway. And um, there's a process where you need to submit. Generally, they're quite conservative in changing the doses. We know that for some antibiotics, uh, DDD does not necessarily reflect the prescribed daily dose. Um, I, I, I can't give the answer right now. Um, then the question is, if you have a viral infection, if you should um, stop antibiotics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, um, th there is um, sometimes a misconception. Um, you know, you have to finish your course of antibiotics, and that was even included a lot in antibiotic campaigns. But um, first of all, most treatment is uh, given for too long anyway. And second, most treatments are given <laughs> for viral infection. And if you have a viral infection, what would be the point of continuing it? I think it's a little bit more tricky for pneumonia um, because if you do a, a throat swab and you find a virus, uh, are you sure always um, that the virus is also responsible for the pneumonia? It may depend on the type of virus and what other signs you have. So it's, 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 it's maybe not as straightforward. But in general, if you have an alternative diagnosis, there's no point in continuing the antibiotic treatment. And actually, WHO has removed this message, finish your prescription from the um, awareness um, campaigns. I mean, it's clear that, you know, we don't want to encourage patients not to follow the prescriptions, but given that so much of the prescriptions are inappropriate and often too long, and it, it, it didn't seem to make, make sense, take the antibiotic until everything is finished. And I think there was an additional question about pertussis. Uh, did pertussis epidemic affect uh, antibiotic prescription for respiratory infections in Europe? Any data? I do not know, but maybe somebody else. It did significantly, yes. And it also led to a shortage of both amoxicillin and amoxicillin clavulanic acid, actually. Because the the estimate that the, uh, the the amount produced was based on didn't really, you know, live up to the actual number of cases. So it definitely it had an impact. I think and Benjamin had another comment, yes. actually. Yes. That's right. Um, also, one uh, quick survey. Maybe some of you read that recent topic about the usefulness of penicillin in streptococcal pharyngitis. As far as I understand it, Belgium and Scotland discontinued the automatic prescription of penicillin in young, healthy individuals. I would like to have your point of view 
I do share the idea that rapid diagnostic tests should be uh, should still be considered and patient treated when positive, regardless of comorbidities. Uta or Benedict? Well, um, so um, they're actually quite so we, we, when we talk about streptococcal pharyngitis, actually quite good data that show that a um, the scoring systems and the tests are not very good at predicting who gets a complication. Um, and then incidence of complication is actually quite low. Um, and the what we all fear, the rheumatic fever is so rare in high income countries nowadays that it's not an indication to prescribe. So um, the benefit of giving an antibiotic is actually minimal and mostly, you know, may have an impact on a short reduction in the duration of symptoms in patients who have uh, group A streptococcal pharyngitis. So um, I, 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 I think there is an argument to be made or it, it is justified to say um, you, you, you um, do not treat and, 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 and you observe. But, you know, all kinds of different approaches are proposed. But when you treat, it's it's not for rheumatic fever. It's probably not for the complications because they're very rare and they're not necessarily predicted by the center score and yet or McIsaac score. And um, the impact on duration of symptoms is rather limited. And then there's the issue of contagiousness, but maybe less less of an issue. So, yeah. And maybe I can add to that, that uh, we did some whole genome sequencing of the strains that caused the streptococcal pharyngitis uh, epidemic uh, last winter, and because we were afraid they were, might be more pathogenic and therefore it should be a good reason to treat them more, but they seem to be exact the same type as usually. So it simply is a relapse or whatever you call it uh, of a long break. I think, look, Mila, you also had a comment uh, earlier. Gregoria, you're you're raising your hand. Hello, are you hearing me? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm I'm a colleague from uh, Erica and other colleagues from the uh, uh, GPs uh, that work in the Howard Group in the regional team uh, that uh, uh, produce the guide we are talking about and we are developing an implementation in the Lisbon region. Re region. Uh, well, we, I highlight to add that uh, uh, we also did uh, um, a microbiological chart of the community. I don't know if you have guidelines for this, but this is it was very important for us because it moves us to change the first option in the uh, inf uh, infection, uh, urinary, urinary infections. Um, so we. Due to the data we collect in this microbial microbiology chart of the community, we have to change the first line. And for us, because of this data, the first line is phosphomycin, and the second is nitro. Uh, I don't know if you you usually do these charts in the community, but for us it was very important, and I think it's a good practice. I'd like to, to, to share this with, with you. Um, and uh, uh, also just to add that it's a very important webinar for us because we are implementing this guide. And this guide is uh, very important for all general practices in Portugal. Thank you. I can maybe comment on the microbiology data to inform prescribing, and that is actually a very complicated issue. I think with urinary tract infections, given the prevalence of ESBL, I completely agree it makes sense to have nitrofurantoin and phosphomycin, but urinary tract infections, for example, are a very good example where you see that you really have to pay attention what your data represent, because usually an uncomplicated urinary tract infections, um, a patient should not get a culture. So, um, and those are microbiology data you will get are from patients who have recurrent urinary tract infections and your prevalence of resistance will be higher. And this has been shown in studies um, looking at uh, cultures that were collected only when indicated or everybody getting a culture. And this is the case for almost all microbiologic studies that you have a biased sample 
and this can lead to wrong conclusions. The other issue is that for now, it's not really clear what cutoff in resistance should be motivate a change in first line prescribing. And um, it's very difficult to do because obviously it's different if you have a pregnant woman or if you have somebody who's immunocompromised or if somebody is completely healthy. Um, and any cutoff in some way is arbitrary, right? If you say 10%, 20%, it's, it's a really a quite difficult topic, but it's quite easy um, to to misinterpret these microbiology surveys. So um, just a word of caution um, and and um, um, yeah, over. So I put up the, the survey as well, but I think we have one more question, but I just thought that since people might be leaving, if you could take a minute, literally less than one minute to answer one question, it would be appreciated. But uh, I think there was one additional question. Go ahead. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, my name is Ludmila Bezichko. I'm from the Czech Republic. I had three questions, actually. I wanted to ask if you use uh, unified guidelines for all outpatient um, uh, clinics, so not only GPs, but also including, uh, let's say, the urologist and uh, uh, other specialties, because we have a problem uh, with uh, different interpretations, so, so different specialists treat uh, the same infection in a different way. So now we are trying to create some guidelines that would be simple and usable for everybody. Second question was about if it's okay to discontinue antibiotic therapy if no bacterial etiology is confirmed. And if you do this, for example, after two days of antibiotic therapy given empirically when a flu is confirmed later. And my third question is about delayed antibiotic prescription. How uh, do you use it? And if you if you use it in your guidelines as well. Those are really, really good questions, but I think they demand a longer meeting <laughs> and we're running out of time. So I would propose if anyone has experience with having guidelines for community care in general, not only for the GPs, but for other specialties as well, to share them with us. And if okay with the group, we will share them with you. And then um, I hope maybe we could come back and continue discussions because this really would be really interesting to do some more sharing of best practice. Thank you, Ludmila, for asking that. But I think it's, I don't know if anyone has a very, very short answer for that, but else we will try to come back to you. And yes, the dentists, really important as well. Thank you, whoever put that in there. I guess I can say that we in Norway, we do have prescribing guidelines, community uh, primary care prescribing guidelines for antibiotics. So we could definitely uh, share those um, if those are useful as well. Um, but well, unfortunately, they're only in Norwegian, but uh, we can share a link uh, available for Google Translate. OK, well, then um, thank you so much for attending this session. Um, if you haven't had a chance to, to give us your feedback, we would certainly appreciate it. Thank you um, for coming. And uh, if you have further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you. Very much.